Hi, this is going to be a video about how engineering minds can often think alike on projects even though they're on opposite sides of the planet in different worlds before the internet uh, joined us all together. So let's take a look at some old magazine projects and I've done this one before. Uh, back in October 1996 I got my uh, 32 channel 40 megahertz logic analyzer, uh, PC based logic analyzer project uh, published and here's the original prototype here. I'll uh, link in a video up here uh, and down below if you haven't seen it and um, this is where I go over the design of this thing uh, talking about the whole history of that and uh, looking at my original uh, drawings and things like that for it. Now I can't remember the exact uh, history behind this but I believe that uh, somebody uh, like ages ago, I've had this forever, told me about this elec Elector Electronics uh, magazine from the UK and it's from uh, 1996 as well and they published a logic analyzer which is near identical uh, to my design and they thought oh they had copied it or uh, something like that but as it turns out um, Elector Electronics actually published this design. Uh, you can see May 1996. They actually published it before mine. Aha! Does that mean, Dave, you copied their design? Oh, well, no. We'll take a look at it. We couldn't actually get uh, this magazine in Australia way back in 1996. I never recall ever seeing I don't think I had ever actually heard of it uh, back then. Because you've got to remember, right? 1996, well, okay, the World Wide Web had just started, but practically, you know, we started still lived in like the isolated world okay it's not the internet that we take for granted these days so pretty much if you didn't see a magazine in your uh, news agent or you weren't told about it by somebody else or you didn't find it in your school library or something like that university library then well you just wouldn't know about these magazines so um yeah I, I had no clue about this so I can't remember if somebody sent me this magazine or I acquired it so that I could uh, check it out after they um said hey you know, you should check this out, see if they copied your design. So anyway, had this for a long time. So I thought we'd just take a look at the differences and the similarities between these two designs and, and why two designers on opposite sides of the planet pretty much came to the same conclusion as far as uh, designing a PC-based logic analyzer in 1995-1996. So just to uh, prove, of course, that mine does actually uh, predate this design, even though it was October 1996. If you don't know, getting a project published in a magazine can take many months lead time. They need to allocate a certain number of pages, certain slot, and because my design was a large project, I think this one's eight pages, the next issue's eight pages or something, uh, and it was spread over two issues, you know, they need to sort of like, they've got their own designs in the pipeline and things like that. So you get slotted in. So I can't remember when I submitted this, but if we have a look at my original prototype here, here we go, I even dated it. <laughs> Isn't that handy? The 25th of February, 96. And as I've gone through in a previous video in some detail, I'm sure um, my original uh, like lab notebook uh, sketches of the original uh, design and the timing diagrams and things like that. Look at that. I've done a video on uh, doing your own timing diagrams. So you can see the date, uh, 17th of the 8th, 95, 25th of the 8th, 95, 28th of the 8th, 95. So yeah, late 95, but it didn't get published until practically a year later. And yes, I was pretty bummed that my uh, big project didn't make the front cover. They had a bloody Sony's new mini disc and, and this uh, PC sleuth card got the front cover. I remember, you know, I was only young. I was getting like, I was a bit miffed. Anyway, let's check it out. But I was kind of chuffed when I got uh, the, like, featured in the side uh, column here. And there it goes, page 90, PC-based logic analyzer, part one, uh, design background and how it works. All right, this is going to be easier if we just go to the PDF. And thankfully, you can actually download all of the archives of Electronics Australia and other magazines on uh, archive.org. Now, you can also get a Elector magazine as well. Unfortunately, they don't actually have the 1996 issue. It jumps from 89 to like 2004 so that's a bummer anyway we've scanned it in uh so we can go to the videotape and like it's they're really good quality scans too so absolutely fantastic ah, moffat's madhouse sadly he's not with us anymore tom moffat but uh anyway yeah let's go to the pdf 
Yes, for all you floating Dave Head aficionados, we'll just randomly move Dave Head. I know some people want it down the bottom, but I think the majority want Dave floating Dave Head somewhere to move around. Anyway, Rod Irving Electronics, who in, who remembers Rod Irving? Anyway, here we go. Um, the PC based logic analyzer part one. Uh, David Bulfoni uh, is a friend of mine. Uh, we just like worked on designs back then. He didn't really have much, if anything, to do with this project, but we sort of like were discussing stuff at the time. So I thought I'd uh, include his name in there just to, you know, give him a bit of a leg up in the industry. Because remember, I've mentioned one of the best things you can do is to actually get published in the magazines and that looks great on your resumes even today it's still a thing it looks very impressive especially to the hr droids anyway so let's have a look at some of the similarities between the designs now mine's a uh, 32 channel uh, job uh ttl cmos uh compatibility fully uh, it's a pc based um internal logic analyzer uh it goes up to uh 40 megahertz um external uh 20 megahertz uh, it's got latch tr trigger work masking it's got full masking for all 32 channels and optional glitch capture i don't actually remember what that's about i have to read my own article anyway i'll link it in uh down below if you want to have a squeeze at the full thing to the Elector design, uh, designed by L. Lamesh. I believe that's uh, Laurent Lamesh. So let's have a look at the specs down here. Now, this one actually had uh, selectable uh, channels anywhere from 16 to 64. Mine was just a fixed 32. So if we have a look at the base level board, I think it's uh, like it could be like 16 and then you can like plug on expansion boards. Now, input level, TTL, I think this is incorrect. And we'll have a look at why later. But anyway, um, this one I didn't put in my specs, but this one only has 4K uh, sample memory. Mine's got 32K. And we'll go into uh, some of the differences that makes in terms of the uh, design of the main control chip. Uh, trigger point is in the center, internal or external. Uh, this design got 50 megahertz. I only pushed mine to 40. I can't remember why I pushed it to 40. I don't know if it was capable of 50 or not. I don't uh, recall, but anyway. Um, they claim uh, external is also uh, 50, I believe, like mine was uh, lower spec for external. So I don't remember why I actually uh, did that. Anyway, oh, we won't go into deep technical details. And maybe I covered that in my previous video. I don't know. It's like an hour long. I'm not going to rewatch it. Anyway, uh, once again, it's got like programmable uh, trigger stuff and things like that. And it's a PC printer port, just like mine. Um, a bit, of course, the form factor is uh, significantly different to mine. Mine was built into one of those packed tech cases this one was like more uh compact and had multiple uh boards now but the huge difference between the designs is that this one used double-sided plated through boards mine was a specific single-sided design and that's a huge difference i made the conscious choice because back then you got to remember pcb design was like you can't get your double-sided plated through board for five bucks like you can these days it was minimum of hundreds of dollars tooling fee just to get uh, the tooling fee, let alone the actual boards. And typically you wouldn't share project panels. Uh, you had to buy the entire panel, like the full size panel. So, you know, it wasn't uncommon to pay like 500 or $800, um, especially here in Australia, to get a board, like a double-sided plated through board uh, prototype manufactured. You take it for granted that you get it for, you know, five, 10 bucks delivered these days or whatever, but for five boards, which is just nuts. But back then it was a big deal. A lot of people, including myself, still manufactured their own boards. I manufactured my uh, prototype board uh, that you saw before. So I manufactured a couple of versions of that. So really one of the goals of publishing a magazine project is so that uh, you're effectively open source in the design so that you provide the uh, PCB layouts in like one-to-one -one in the magazine, or you could download it from the early Electronics Australia bulletin board at the time. You know, you dial into the BBS with your three 300 board or 1200 board modem that was screaming and you would uh, download the uh, PCB files or you, you know, simply scanned it from the magazine uh, with the photocopier and you manufactured the overlay yourself and you etched, you know, exposed and etched 
and drilled your own board. That was very common. So one of my goals was to make it so that anyone could manufacture this thing. And you could download the uh, programmable logic files, as we'll see. You could download that from the bulletin board uh, for free and things like that. But I did actually sell pre-programmed uh, chips for this thing if you wanted that. But you didn't have to. It was all open. You could effectively just download it and build it yourself. So yeah, I had the target goal of single-sided board. They obviously went, oh, this has got to be double-sided. And, you know, that's it. Now, one of the things that uh, made these designs very similar, almost copied in quote marks, is that they both use uh, the Lattice ISP uh, 1016, LSI, ISP, LSI 1016 uh, programmable logic device from Lattice Semiconductor. Um, and it had, uh, both designs actually had a control, uh, they had a control uh, PLD down here, and then a, uh, like a channel PLD over here, which did the mask uh, triggering and uh, stuff like that. So both designs would like, from that point of view, identical. So here's a look inside the control LSI uh, chip over here. And you can see it's going to be, I'll compare it with mine, it's going to be more complicated. Um, and they've got the um, state diagram over here. I didn't do a state diagram for mine, so that's interesting. But anyway, it's got, uh, it looks like uh, pre and post uh, trigger counters in here like this because you have to get a trigger point in the middle of your sample. And, you know, you had to do a little bit of uh, logic to actually do that to ensure you get 50% uh, pre-sample. 50% post sample because that's very common not only in oscilloscopes but also logic analyzers that's uh, the default 50% pre and post because when you trigger on something okay you set your trigger point but usually you often want to see what caused that trigger and then you want to see what happened after that trigger hence why 50% uh, pre post so that's why we've got looks like uh, I, I'm not going to analyze this in depth but that's why you got uh, true trigger and then you got uh, trigger logic here by the looks of it it looks significantly more uh, complicated than mine. Anyway, um, this is the oscillator input here. Uh, this is the oscillator divider. You'll see uh, in a minute that I do mine external uh, to the chip, and I'll potentially explain why in a minute. And uh, preset uh, down counters. And anyway, there you go. That's internal to the logic uh, control chip. And then they've got the trigger chip down here and we'll compare uh, the two trigger chips uh, shortly, but very similar. And I think we'll see on my design here, the overall uh, block diagram a little bit better than on their one. What we've got here is our inputs down here. We've got our pull up resistors here. We've got uh, 74 uh, ACT 574s here. I mentioned those in a minute. Then we've got the uh, SRAM of 62256, which was the uh, popular cache and popular relatively cheap <laughs> and readily available uh, cache SRAM memory that was used in PCs at the time. And does anyone remember the fake cache scam where you'd get either fake or blank uh, chips and you'd pay these chips, you'd put them in and people think that their computer's faster, but it wasn't unless you really benchmarked it properly. Anyway, the fake cache RAM scam, that was uh, great. Anyway, um, and then I've got two ISP LSI 1016 logic devices here, uh, one for each 16 uh, channels, they're the trigger chip, and then one control ISP LSI 1016 over there. Oops, it looks like my PDF didn't uh, insert the several pages from this. Anyway, here's their overall block diagram here, uh, and it's very similar. Look at this. So here's their input connector over here. They used exactly the same um, 0.1 inch uh, header as I did because that was, of course, the obvious choice. What what else would you use? Even today, you would still use a 0.1 inch header. That's what you still get on a lot of uh, oscilloscopes these days. You'll get a 0.1 inch header because it's just standard, industry proven, easy, simple, cheap. And then you've got uh, pull up resistors exactly like I did. And then 74AC574, they used exactly Exactly the same chip here, but they used an AC, not an AC, whereas I use the ACT version, and the AC is a CMOS version. AC stands for Advanced CMOS. That means it has CMOS compatible input levels, but if you get the ACT version, that means um, it, to the T stands for TTL compatible uh, logic threshold levels, and there is a, you know, a significant difference there. So I don't understand, as I said, why in their specs down here, get Dave head out of the way, that they actually claim 
TTL input level compatibility. How can you claim that when you don't have TTL compatible parts? Whereas I specifically use the TTL uh, compatible parts. So anyway, it, like in most cases, it's not a huge deal. So why did we both choose a 74AC variant a 574 chip? Because the 574 is your standard octal D-type flip-flop. Um, it's just like the obvious choice. What else would you use? Now you could have potentially incorporated that inside the PLD uh, device itself, but I don't believe it actually had the flexibility because it's only a PLD, a programmable logic device. It's not an FPGA, which uses a more uh, complex uh, uh, fabric inside with more flip-flop availability and stuff like that. So I'm sure both of us would have uh, investigated that. I don't recall precisely. It was like, come on, it's like 25 years ago. <laughs> it's a long time ago. Um, I'm sure I would have investigated and they're going, oh, look, I don't have, it. this PLD doesn't have the input flexibility to actually uh, do this. So we need an external latching chip because you've got to latch all of the data at the same time across all your channels. So you want to do that with one synchronous uh, clock. So you need an octal D-type flip-flop or some sort of octal latch or something like that. Uh, and you want uh, eight, you want to minimize your number of chips. So you're going to choose an octal version, which has um, eight. Yeah, there are like other obscure 16 channel variants probably, but like you can't get them. Whereas uh, you can go down to your local store, you know, you could go down in your local Tricky Dicks and you could buy a, you know, a 74574. But you know, the AC variants you might have to get are a bit special. Anyway, so certainly, yes, the AC574, because it has an enable, it has a clock input, and it just latches all of the data. So yes, you want that synchronous sampling. Here it is. It's got the clock input uh, down here, and then it just samples all the channels at exactly the same time. And that's exactly what you want for both uh, timing analysis mode and state analysis mode. But there's basically two modes. Every logic analyzer, good one, should have timing analysis mode, which uses an internal clock, and state analysis mode, which uses an external clock. So in the case of state analysis, this external clock here could actually come from your circuit under test. So that's how you can synchronize the sampling of your input latches to your circuit under test, and that might be vital, um, as opposed to asynchronous sampling, which uses an internal free running clock just latching this stuff in. So yeah, that was just the obvious choice. Um, no surprises why we both chose an identical uh, front end here. And of course, then we uh, you would latch that directly, in this case, into the, uh, the trigger PLD, which is this one. Yeah, they actually call it trigger unit and the control unit. And my, it looks like their main board only uses only has the one trigger unit where it whereas I had two because mine was a 32 channel design on the one board. And it just made sense to uh, separate the trigger unit from the control unit like this, as well as there just simply wasn't the internal resources to do everything in one chip. Um, at you, A, you didn't have the pin count uh, to do it, and B, it didn't have the internal logic. And I'm sure in my previous video I've shown that uh, or explained that I had like 98 or near 100% utilization in in these devices so my all the logic and stuff barely fitted so from an architecture point of view the front end and the triggering and control aspect of this these i you could essentially say they're like not identical designs but you know they they're basically following the similar approach and they're using the exact same programmable logic device why did we both choose uh, like two engineers on the other side of the planet choose exactly the same CPLD to do the job. Well, uh, it, they actually hint here in this article. I didn't. I don't know if I mentioned it in mine. I don't think so. But they hint here that further reading. There you go. The ISP starter kit in uh, December '94. It looks like I haven't checked, but they obviously did an article featuring the Lattice ISP LSI starter kit which you could buy for 99 US dollars it was about a, it sold for about 150 Australian dollars here and obviously I saw this ad in the local Electronics Australia magazine at the time I don't know if they ran an article on it or it was just an ad and I went whoa wow you can do programmable logic for 150 bucks because you gotta remember this is like the mid 90s if you wanted to do FPGAs or PLDs back then 
you like it was thousands of dollars and you had to be a big company or whatever like it was really difficult for like the hobbyist or the midnight engineer the one-man band to actually get into fpgas it was seriously expensive business the software tools alone cost thousands of dollars and the demo like uh, starter kit boards and things like that then another couple of hundred dollars again minimum and so it cost you thousands of dollars to get into programmable logic devices and or fpgas because none of the free tools that we take uh for granted these days it costs serious money so when lattice came out and said look uh, we've got this isp lsi star a kit for like 99 bucks 150 bucks aussie bucks oh, winner winner chicken dinner like we both obviously saw that ad and went and jumped on that and went wow this is great i, I have no idea i'm just buying this kit what, what can i use it for hmm logic analyzers they're usually pretty ex like hard and difficult to do and expensive you can really only uh do i explained in my article how like the complexity of a logic analyzer it would normally require and i think i actually did do a previous uh design somewhere maybe i can find it like that had like uh, it was all ttl solution and it had like eight plug-in boards like each like uh, maybe eight bits uh eight uh, channels per plug-in board or something they get a big control board it requires hundreds of like chips to like do a 32 channel logic analyzer like this so really difficult uh you know complex um task to do it with discrete ttl logic so really an excellent choice for uh a cpld and they've got like a little article uh, thing here. It's got, it contains 96 registers, 32 universally applicable IO lines, four advanced inputs. I can't remember what the advanced inputs did. Three clock inputs and a network that governs all internal links, global routing pools. All inputs and outputs are TTL compatible. Each input is capable of sourcing and syncing up to four milliamps. Uh, and it could go up to 90 megahertz. So yeah, I once again, the maximum speed you could do with this thing depended upon the internal logic logic that you uh, built into this thing and by the way uh, this chip uh, came in two versions uh, it was there was the LSI 1016 and there was the ISP LSI 1016 and the ISP one was uh, hence like the acronym in system programmable so it's reprogrammable whereas the LSI one it was cheaper but it was mask programmable so you could only program it once and that was it um, and the starter kit came with this little um, I think it might have been parallel port based or was it serial port based uh, programmer that you could just program these chips so I made up a little like PLCC uh, zip a socket so I could program all these chips because I actually sold uh, the chips for the uh, kit for this thing and so yeah I made that all up and hooked it into the programmer and I could you could reprogram these chips and you could do it for 150 bucks <laughs> Yeah, I remember the generic array blocks. Uh, they had uh, each block has 28 inputs, programmable X and or XOR arrays, uh, four outputs which may be set up, generic logic blocks. Yeah, that's why I said we had to use the external 574. Yeah, it just didn't have the uh, flip flop capability it just had the generic logic blocks and stuff like that the output routing pools and things like that so yeah i can't remember like how many flip-flops they had in this thing but certainly um you couldn't like use it to latch all the inputs so that's why we both had to use the external uh 574 latch so why Laurent used uh, this SRAM, I, I don't remember the SRAM at the time, but I used mine because it was cheap, readily available, relatively cheap, readily available, used in uh, PCs. As I said, it was standard 62256 cache RAM. It was 32K. Unfortunately, they only used uh, 4K on this. So, so mine was more powerful in terms of uh, sample memory there. Now, uh, the PC parallel port interface, here's where it differs a bit. Um, uh, Laurent obviously uh, does, uh, decided to uh, latch in like data and have internal registers and latch those into the uh, control chip. Whereas I didn't do that. We'll take a look at mine. And he doesn't need much external uh, circuitry here. There's a few gates around here. But uh, yeah, basically an LSR245 latch and the oscillator down in here, which goes straight in and Bob's your uncle. That's uh, all it is. Whereas my one, I actually used two 8 uh, bit serial expanders, the 7 for HCT259 and you should know that I'm a 259 fanboy and I've used it in previous uh, PC based uh, designs as well so I you know like I just use that to latch all of my con these are all the control 
signal. So the software just basically just, you know, can change these uh, signals in real time, which actually made the logic inside the programmable logic device uh, simpler. I used a 40 megahertz crystal oscillator. As I said, don't remember why I used 40. Instead of 50, I used some 390s to do the uh, divider. I didn't do that internally, whereas Laurent decided to do that. So I had a few extra uh, chips here. So we did implement the parallel port in a different way, but why did we both use the parallel port? Well, that was the obvious choice back in the day. Okay, we could have uh, used the RS-232 serial port, and we could have used a uh, like a RS-232 chip and then a microcontroller to read in the serial data, but then you would have had another programmable uh, logic device. It would have been slow interface uh, because what, you know, 96 or 115K board at maximum, right? And like, and you had to send serial commands to the thing. No, it just wasn't a thing. And remember, USB didn't come out until probably like five years later, I think 2001, and that was USB 1.0, right? So USB wasn't even imagined then. So it's like PC parallel port based in the mid 90s was still the interface of choice if you wanted to um, interface to a PC unless you designed like a plug-in ISA card or something like that. Um, yeah, so it's no surprise we both uh, use that. But we did have, uh, but we did implement it sort of in different ways. And at the time, I don't actually recall if I actually considered putting this inside the programmable logic device, whether or not I... I don't know. I don't think I did. I think I just decided that no, I like having the two five nines. I, you know, as I said, I was a bit of a fanboy of them, and yeah, and then it just made sense that we could just have the control signals like this. The controls that had plenty of pins on the uh, ten sixteen uh, PLD, and you know, that's it. Simple. You know, I didn't want to have to like latch in like internal registers and stuff like that. So yeah, I just used them external. And here's my uh, internal logic inside my control chip. And I like uh, always use like, it's nice to use like dashed lines to like separate sections. Like this is the control logic section. This is uh, the post trigger counter. This is the clock polarity selection. This is trigger selection, you know, trigger delay and things like that. So we both had our programmable uh, trigger delay. Uh, why? Because, well, that was like an advanced feature on logic analyzers and we've got our programmable logic device if we can fit it hey why not but here's a potential reason why that i maybe didn't include a lot of stuff internally that uh, laurent did in his design is that as i said i got 32k of ram i had a bigger ram address counter i had like uh, just you know, more stuff to do inside the chip and as i said i was already pushing like 95 to near 100 percent utilization of this device in fact i had to mod uh, i can recall modifying the design and making it fit and go whoa yes i made the bastard fit you know it was it was quite an effort to get it into that chip because uh you know, it was these were limited resources chips you couldn't just like you know all this stuff here just barely fitted so as you can see there were like flip-flops inside uh, the device but they were like limited in terms of uh functionality but you know there's like plenty of muxes and gates and things like that which you can wire in but anyway, that's my once again i won't go through the whole operation of it but yep that was tight as a nun's nasty that design let me tell you all right, let's have a look at the trigger unit here, shall we? Here's my design, here's Lorentz's design over here, and this is what's inside the 1016 trigger chip. Now, I've used uh, two 16-bit shift registers over here, uh, data and clock input. They are cascaded like that, so only require one data input. And this is how I was able to uh, set the uh, the inverse polarity for each channel. You know, select the polarity, trigger polarity for each channel, and what I call a mask uh, a channel that means enable or disable a particular channel that you want to uh, trigger from so you obviously had to get all this data inside the uh, CPLD like you couldn't do it there just wasn't enough pins on the chip you couldn't do it parallel so you had to do it serial so just simple serial and data clock coming from the in this particular case came directly from the uh, PC uh, control those uh, 74HC259s I believe that directly came from didn't go through the control chip it was completely under software control so the software talked directly to the uh, trigger chip itself to actually set it up and you'll notice that I like once again use the dash separators to separate this in 
into, you know, a really easy to understand groups. So the mask and invert shift registers, the inverse, uh, the invert comparator array, the mask array, as I called it, the grouping array. It was just one big AND gate, basically. Um, Why well, I showed them separate, it just looks nicer, I guess. Um, and uh, data output mux. I can't actually remember why I needed a data output mux, but anyway, here's the data input, okay, coming from the, those latch chips, and that, you know, that goes to your data input like this so that you can trigger from it. But why I had to latch them, oh, that was to read out. I think that was to read out the data because they're all on a common bus. That's right, they're all on combo bus, so you had to read the data back out of memory and you couldn't do it in parallel, so I read the data out in series like that. So I included that in the trigger chip, not in the control chip, the trigger chip, because I already had the data lines there and the data lines were all, if you look at the system block diagram, won't go back, but if you look at the system block diagram, you'll notice that the data line is, uh, it's basically one big data bus which connects the trigger chips, the memory, uh, and doesn't go into the control chip because we don't, it basically it's the trigger chip and the memory. So it, it bypasses the control completely. So that's why I put the data output mux, the read, the readout mux inside the uh, trigger chip. It might seem odd, but that means you didn't have to wire yet another bus on the PCB over to the uh, control chip. So yeah, it was just easier and, and hence why I could get like a single sided layout because I didn't have buses running everywhere. Anyway, and if we have a look at Lorentz design here, it does exactly the same thing. The shift register like this, 32-bit uh, shift register, 16 of them are for what he calls enable, uh, which is probably a better name. I, I just called a mask array. Um, and the other one is a level array. You know, it's sort of like polarity. It's the same as my um, inverse comparator array because you want to know whether or not you want to trigger off a, uh, a positive, off a one or a zero for each of the, in this case, 16 channels. We both fitted 16 channels inside one of these logic chips. Why? Because that was basically based on the pin count, pretty much. And you probably couldn't have fitted any more circuitry inside anyway, even if you did have the bigger uh, pin count. But yeah, anyway, yeah, we both implemented that absolutely identical because we had to get the series. You just did not have enough data lines coming into this chip. Didn't have enough pins to uh, get from the control logic chip over to the trigger chip, you couldn't just have like 16 parallel lines. In fact, 32 parallel lines, you just didn't have the number of chips. So you had to do it serially. Um, he's done the serial load a bit differently to how I've done it over here. I've done it simpler, just use one data and one clock line. He's used four lines for some reason. Not sure why. Anyway, and he's got like system clock going in there. I didn't care about the system clock. Um, I, I just, yeah, I really didn't care at all because the trigger was independent of any of the system clocking stuff. And over here, he's implemented his uh, logic, his trigger logic differently using different gates. But this is whole, this is the whole like De Morgan's theorem thing. If I did, yeah, I've done a video on De Morgan's theorem. You can implement exactly the same logic using different configurations of gates, ands, ors, nands, you know, nots, exclusive ors, you know, you can implement it different ways. I just happen uh, to implement it with the grouping array as one big and gate. He did, but one big or gate here. And yes, this greater than or equal to one is the IEC standard symbol for an or gate. And the equals to one here is the exclusive or gate and and is an and. And um, yeah, it was just maybe, leave it in the comments down below, was that a publishing standard in Europe um, at, at the time to use IEC symbols? I know here in Australia, we use the, your uh, traditional symbols over here. And it would have been interesting to know whether or not I sub if I submitted my design using the IEC standard symbols, would Electronics Australia have redrawn it as this? Maybe. Maybe just to keep like the style standard um, kind of thing for the magazine. And I can remember at uh, university at time in digital logic uh, course, can't remember what one it was. Actually, both myself and David Bulfoni, we both failed. Um, <laughs> we both failed. And uh, like it was a uh, like assignment thing. Uh, we submitted our assignment and we used IEC symbols. And they, and they failed us because 
they had no idea what the the faculty there, uh, the lecturer, whoever it was, had no idea what IEC symbols were. They just went, what's this rubbish? I, this is not, even though we got it actually correct, um, we, we we were just like fanboys of, of the IEC symbols at the time because it was being pushed heavily and I, you know. Anyway, so yeah, failed. That's, that's interesting. Failed the class. Anyway, I decided, to, you know, the publishing standard in Australia at the time was to use your uh, traditional logic symbols, not the new IEC standard stuff. But anyway, leave it in the comments down below. What did you use in the mid nineties? Anyways, yeah, so Lament did it using one big OR gate. I did it using one big AND gate. And then of course you have to use the exclusive OR for the level control. And of course used an exclusive OR gate here for, uh, once again, he's only showing one, but this is actually done like, uh, you know, 16 times for the entire thing, uh, whereas I actually displayed them all down here. So, you know, the exclusive OR gate, you pretty much had to use an exclusive OR gate because that's a controlled inverter, basically, is what an exclusive OR gate uh, does. You can make it up with lots of other gates, but why bother? Um, anyway, exclusive OR gate. So, uh, yeah, so that's equivalent to my invert comparator array here, and you can see they're exclusive, um, uh, well, exclusive NOR. He's got uh, exclusive OR. But once again, like uh, whether you use a an XNOR or an XOR doesn't really matter. It all comes out in the wash. It's all De Morgan's theorem and simplification and all sorts of stuff. And uh, then the enable array over here was an AND, whereas I used an OR. So it, it's, it, it does exactly the same logic. We both implement it. We both were in the same mindset of thinking exactly how to do this, that we need a a, a controlled, uh, you know, inverse array. We, we need a masking or enable array. And then we need an, a grouping thing, which groups them all together. And, um, and then we need to control it all with shift registers. So these are practically identical designs. They just, the, the logic just slightly differs, but it's absolutely equivalent. So we both did exactly the same thing. And has Laurent done the mux in? Yes, he has. He's done the multiplex in down here. I've done exactly the same thing. So once again, we're in exactly the same mindset because you had to have the all of your 16 or 32 channels coming into the trigger chip because you need all the channels so that you can trigger it from them. You've already routed those on the PCB. They're already inside the chip. It makes sense to put your readout multiplexer there. Um, so yeah, he's got a lot of ex extra stuff in here. Not sure, you know, all sorts of uh, control stuff, chip select stuff and things like that. So I'm not sure. Maybe that's to do with like the uh, multi-channel expansion and stuff. Yeah, something like that. Whereas mine was all like integrated into one design, whereas he had to account for, you know, having multiple boards uh, cascaded together, multiple 16 channel boards. But yeah, we're both doing exactly the same thing. And I guarantee you that would have been the reasoning is that like it's a PCB layout thing and um, just, just general en engineering optimization. We both would have thought, yep, we've got the signals inside the trigger chip, why not read the data out from the trigger chip because it's on the same data bus. We've already used our PCB lines coming in there. So yeah, uh, we were absolutely in the same mindset. These are practically identical uh, <laughs> designs. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, you could say it's remarkable, but it's not really. I mean, this was uh, like logical conclusions of any design engineer doing this sort of thing, once we came up with the same design, okay, we want to use, we've got this great new LSI starter kit, really cheap, what can we do? Let's do a logic analyzer. It's going to be PC based. It's going to have, you know, 16 channels per logic uh, control uh, LSI chip because that's limited by the pinout and the internal uh, functionality. We've decided we've got the 16 channels. So then we're both going to go, well, we've already routed the uh, pins to that uh, trigger chip. So we might as well read our data out from there it's already connected through to, to the memory bus and uh, like it, it it's, it's not surprising at all that we came up with practically the exact same design except that we had different logic i you know it's it's just, I, it's funny but it's not surprising 
And here's the uh, second part of my article here, and it just like has internal uh, photos of the construction and the PCB overlay. As you can see, uh, single-sided jobby, which is a totally different uh, to Lorentz uh, design, which he just went like from the get-go, just went oh, double-sided um, for uh, both boards, multiple boards. Whereas I wanted to get everything all on one board, and as you can see, like there's you know quite a few links in there. Of course, I couldn't, you can't do a design like this with absolutely no links. There's just too many paint in the ass data buses running everywhere and uh, it's just too difficult and that's why uh, it was really nice to be able to get all pull all the data from the tri trigger chips here because the trigger chips were already wired into the RAM chips here so rather than you know imagine having to get uh, these this data bus here imagine having to try and get that like here here it is comes in here like this routes around like that into the SRAM and then into the trigger chip like that. So imagine then having to try and uh, run this from the chip to, you know, some other readout circuitry or something like that. There's no way you could have done this design on a single-sided uh, layout in that particular case. So, um, yeah, I can kind of sort of now vaguely remember being very excited, like, oh, how am I going to get this data out? And then, yeah, read it out from the trigger chip because um, it's already in there anyway. And, you know, it had a few gates left over inside and, you know, it, it, Bob's your uncle. So anyway, it's about taking measurements and uh, stuff like that. There's a front panel. You can do that yourself. And the overlay, as I said, uh, that wasn't a one-to-one. -one. Is that? No, you had to scale that yourself. Parts list and all that. And of course, uh, oh, that's it. Oh, that's all she wrote. Um, I know, I think there's another page somewhere else. But anyway, there you go. So there you go. That's how, well, back in the day, you thought, hey, you know, somebody's copied somebody's project here, which, but as I said, like, that wouldn't have been a problem. It's just a curiosity uh, thing. And because essentially when you publish a design, it was open source. So, you know, we were doing open source between before, like, open source hardware before the open term open source hardware was ever invented. Um, so, like, we've been doing published magazine projects ever, ever since back in Wireless Weekly, back in, like, the 1920s, 1930s, things like that. So that's how far back, like open source hardware, open source hardware, um, essentially uh, goes. And you know, it wouldn't be a problem if I copied his design or he copied my design. They are like uh, fundamentally different. Mine is more focused. Uh, the hobbyists can build it themselves because it's a single-sided layout. This one's more professional. You had to order the double-sided solder mask, uh, plated through PCBs and everything. This one was a bit more expandable. Mine actually um, used graphical software whereas this one actually used uh, a text text-based software because you could actually um, the ASCII extended ASCII uh, set actually had you could draw waveforms using the extended ASCII character set so I done it all using uh, that whereas mine was done uh, I, I used a graphical uh, you know graphical user interface I could just fit all 32 channels on the uh, screen which is why I probably didn't bother with any uh, expansion things so that's interesting how you can have two different designers essentially publish all my, you know, sort of identical projects in terms of uh, functionality and especially in terms of like uh, how they're implemented in all the uh, trigger and uh, control logic and stuff like that and both use the same interfaces because they were the logical uh, conclusion at the time. And yes, I know this is uh, transparent because the front cover is green. So it, it, that's pretty funky, isn't it? <laughs> I like that. Wow. Yeah, look at that. <laughs> <laughs> that is that is spooky <laughs> because that's a there's the cover there's the front cover must have some green on the back there too green swirl and yeah it, it, no it's yellow that's that's yellow um but it treats that as see-through so <laughs> there you go <laughs> transparent cover that is fantastic i like that i'm going to screenshot that so if you watched all the way through to the end, thank you for indulging me on this. I just wanted to like show the differences between uh, two different <laughs> designs and it just so happens to be my one. And we basically did it at exactly the same time and we published without each other, you know, knowledge of the other design because, well, we just didn't know about it back then unless you bought the magazine because there were no web pages, you know, and the web was really in its infancy. But yeah, we just came up with essentially the identical design and published it because, well, it 
seemed like the thing to do at the time. And the let us know in the comments down below if you would have done it a different way. Remember, 1995, no USB. How would you have done this? What parts would you have used and why? Would you have used an FPGA? Would you have used a discrete you know, TTL logic for everything? And as I said, just done it on the multiple card, plug-in cards and things like that. Let us know down below or were there some other uh, method to doing it? Because uh, my recollection back then is the mid-90s, 95, like to do FPGA uh, stuff. There was actually, I um, there was um, another. There was an FPGA-based logic analyzer project published like like six months or twelve months after my one, and that was done by uh, Peter Baxter, who uh, at the time I met him like uh, six seven years ago or something. Uh, in the end, and he was like an FPGA like filled uh, like he was like a Xilinx approved. Uh, don't know if Xilinx or Altera, but he's, he was one of the approved FPGA uh, developers back then. So you got all the tools and and things like that. But you know. If for your average, you know, backyard hobbyist or a midnight engineer to develop your FPGAs, wasn't that cheap back then, especially, and to actually use them. I believe these uh, lattice chips, they, they weren't that expensive, but as I said, they weren't didn't have much functionality. Yes, you could have done all this in one FPGA at the time, certainly, um, but it would have cost a lot more. I can't remember uh, Peter's uh, design, actually. Aha, uh -huh. I found Peter's design. It was actually March 1999. It was a lot later uh, than I actually uh, thought. So uh, yeah, it wasn't until like almost year 2000 before like an FPGA logic analyzer project uh, came out. So let's have a quick squiz. Here is the first of two articles presenting what is almost certainly the most complex project design we've ever published, a high-performance logic analyzer which provides 32 input channels, sampling rate up to 100 meg samples per second. It's freestanding using a low-cost computer monitor for display and also driver printer or download capture to a PC. I can remember being impressed with this. I didn't know Peter at the time. Uh, I only met him, like, you know, decades later. Um, and, yeah, I was impressed that it actually connected up to a VGA monitor at the time. Like that was just like absolutely stunning. So, oh geez, that that's really, geez, we're really going to town now. Look, you know, got to have the fans on there. So yeah, really, really serious business. What does it use? Sorry, I don't think I can rotate this. Once again, use the same 62256S RAM that I did. Uh, and uh, binary to gray code converters, address bus, time stamping. You could have rising edge, falling edge, trigger, uh, chain. There's the XOR chains trigger. So, you know, yeah, I don't think there was any uh, external pattern triggering. But anyway, yeah, there it is. Altera um, EFP81500 programmer logic device. Hands up if you remember that. There, yeah. Uh, I, sorry, 81, yeah, 81500. Both the uh, control FPGA and the data capture FPGA, as he calls it. He uses a Z80 CPU down in there. So, you know, really went to town. It was, and I remember he asked, uh, sold a kit for this thing but it was yeah i think yeah that was one of the most as they said like the most complex project ever published in electronics australia magazine i think wow oh look at this he still uses the 74574 winner winner chicken dinner but now uh, like he had like external uh probe interface uh type things but <laughs> yeah it's still there see even back then probably why wouldn't you put the 574 latches inside the Altera FPGA oh sorry it's not an FPGA it's programmable logic it's a PLD sorry so yes um uh, probably no wonder it couldn't why because were they still that expensive a solution in 1999 that you could, yeah, you know, I probably developed this in like 90, started this in 98 or something perhaps, um, that uh, were they still so expensive that you, you know, had to use the lower cost pro and less flexible uh, PLD, the programmable logic device. And once again, because of the lack of the FPGA, uh, you know, fabric uh, inside, not as flexible, hence why the use of external uh, 74HC uh, Five seven fours. They still could not get that. He just didn't have. He had flip flops internally, but not the in the numbers required to do all of the latching. So anyway, I hope you found that as interesting as I did. And leave your thoughts and comments uh, down below. And as always, uh, you can catch me on the alternative platforms. You can catch me on the libraries and the bit shoots and the Vimeos and the daily motions and the uh, whatever. There's another one, a D Live or something. I don't know. I'm on everything. Catch you next time.